This is a mattress change notification. Oh, I'm moving to a much better place where there is no tears, no dying. There'll be no more pain. This is. And a wall of jasper too Streets in front of my house There'll be a pure gold Oh, it's a place where we'll never grow This is a team can go ahead and begin making their way as he was singing that song uh, I remember I remember uh, brother Don Johnson singing that song so many times and I, I'm looking forward to seeing brother Don Johnson but I'm I'm looking forward to heaven but tonight I think I mentioned this Sunday night but tonight the closest we can get to heaven is when we begin to worship because God inhabits the praises of his people tonight our opportunity to to experience a little bit of that address change that Brother Keith just sang about is for us to worship. Let's worship the Lord tonight with him.
worthy of our praise. So thankful for, for what I feel in this house tonight. You can go ahead and be seated. We'd like to welcome you. I, I forgot to mention this at the start of service, but I'm glad I did because we've seen a few more people come in. And, and if you're a first-time guest, if, you, if you've been here for 50 years, no matter what, it's good to have you at the Gospel Tabernacle worshiping with us. And I'm thankful for, for everybody being here tonight. I've got to... Let's make them feel welcome. Got a couple of announcements. Uh, Easter is on its way. You may not think so, but if you stop by the candy aisle at Walmart, you'll believe it. And that's what I'm asking you to do. Stop by the candy aisle at Walmart. Pick up some candy. When, when Easter actually gets here, um, here in the next few weeks, we're going to be taking up candy for the next few weeks till Easter. We're going to give out candy to all the kids on Easter. We're going to make a big push to have a bunch of kids here. We'll have a bunch of kids here on Easter. And so we want to have candy to give them so they don't feel like they let, they missed out by going to church. We love our kids. We want to invest in them. And candy is just a sweet way to invest in our kids. So bring candy if you can. Uh, also, we're going to have a musical here in the next few moments. And uh, the youth and the college and career class will be t kind of together tonight. Um, and so they'll be in, in their classroom this evening. But but as, as the men of music play the musical, um, the, the youth and the college and career class can go along with all the, all the young kids, all the children. Um, and the men of music go ahead and play the music. music we got here at, church, at gospel tabernacle and brother ben is going to come brother ben cantrell in case you didn't know his last name uh, this is brother ben cantrell he has a word for you we, we let all the the young people all the children leave they're going to their class so they can get taught but tonight if you'll let god speak to you he's got a word for you i know brother ben didn't didn't just go go on uh, the website go on some website and pick up a sermon but instead, he got a word for us. He went to God. That's where we need to go for sermon. He went to God and got a sermon for you. And if you'll let God speak to you, he will. Let's welcome Brother Ben tonight. Hey, Amen. I don't know who keeps sending out the memos, letting everybody know when I'm preaching, but they're going to have to stop. Everybody's staying home on me. Um, I am honored to be here. I always want to give honor where honor is due um, to both Pastor and Bishop Hodum for <clears throat> trusting in me and selecting me. It, it means a lot that they didn't trust me enough to stand up here and to preach, teach in their absence. So I, I am very honored to be here to be able to speak. Um, I have uh, had a, I don't know, it's been different this time since he asked me to preach. I've had a, I can't quite understand it, a burden or a, a 
It's like a blanket of uh, weight that's been laid upon me. Now, before you start running, I'm not going to preach you under the pew, so don't worry about that. But I do believe that I have a message for us tonight, um, a message of encouragement uh, that may help us if we let it. If not, it, at least it's for me. <clears throat> I'm preaching to myself, Brother Rob, if no one else. Um, but we'll go straight into the scripture. Uh, it's been interesting trying to study while my little kid pulls me off the couch to get his toys off me the couch every five minutes. But... We're going to get into it anyways. It's 1 Samuel chapter 17, we're going to start in verse 2. Uh, we'll be skipping around just a little bit. Um, 1 Samuel 17, chapter 17, verse 2, and it says, And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah, and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the other side. And Israel stood on the mountain on the other side, and there was a valley between them, and there went out, a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. I want to skip over some of it and go down to verse 8. And he says, And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am I not, am, am I not, am not I a Philistine? And ye servants to Saul, choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. Now, I know that this is a very familiar story in the Bible, and we've probably heard it preached from a thousand times and... Uh, I probably will be preaching something that maybe you've heard before from this, but this is what the Lord laid upon my heart. Actually, he, he uh, give me one word. Uh, one word that he laid upon my heart was champion. He just laid that upon my heart. I said, okay, Lord, champion, now what? What else goes, you know? And uh, so I had to do some digging and, see, you know, searching. And um, it, sometimes I like it when he just says, here, do this, preach this. But it wasn't the case this time. I begin to immediately think about that word, champion, and, and begin to think about, okay, what do you want me to say about this? How do you want me to approach this? What do you want me to, what context do you want me to speak on? And he just kept saying, champion, champion, champion. And, uh, immediately my mind goes to David and Goliath, and I begin to read and begin to search, and I just went ahead and looked up the definition of champion. Now, I, I'm going to go ahead and warn you, I probably won't get too excited, I don't know, uh, but I, I'm going to probably teach or preach to us, maybe a little of both, but um, <clears throat> the word champion, the definition, is simply defined as a person who has defeated or surpassed all rivals in a competition, especially sports. Uh, it's also a person who fights or argues for a cause on behalf of someone else. So someone who's defeated or surpassed all rivals, and someone who does it for a cause or on behalf of someone else. Goliath was a champion by the very definition. The Bible, and I skipped over the part where it defines his height, his stature, and his weaponry, but he was a champion just by his sheer size and his weaponry and, and, and his strength. He was stronger than any other soldier in the army of the Philistines. Let me, let me preference that by just clarifying the army of the Philistines. Goliath was a champion by the very definition because he fought for the army of the Philistines. He fought on their behalf. Um, as I began to study uh, a story come back to my mind, I um, thought that when in, when in college I had to take a literature class and I thought this is useless. Why am I going to, I am never going to use that. Why in the world? But here I am. Uh, <clears throat> there's a story, and many of us may know it, and I, I really hate that Bishop Hodum and uh, Pastor Hodum isn't here because I, I'm sure that Bishop Hodum has read this, and I can always look over and get that nod of confirmation that he's following me, and that's always comforting. So I, I really regret that they're not here, but I know they're about doing the Father's work and helping where needed. But the story that I want to talk about for a little bit is the Iliad. Maybe we read it in college or even in high school. The Iliad is known as an ancient Greek epic poem. 
That's how it's defined. It's traditionally attributed to Homer. It is set during the Trojan War, a 10-year siege of the city famously known as Troy. It was besieged by a coalition of Greek states. It tells of the battles and the events during the weeks of the quarrel between King Agamemnon and the warrior Achilles. We're very familiar with the term Achilles, and we're very familiar with the story of Troy, or if not, uh, I, I encourage you to look it up. It's an interesting read. Uh, now, some people would say it's fictional, but I've learned that there's a little bit of truth in every bit of fiction. Achilles was a champion who would fight on behalf of King Agamemnon. Uh, when in school we did, uh, we researched it. We we began to learn about how he became into power because he he united the Greek states and <clears throat> at a time uh, in this time period, kings would come together to battle and and they would in one last ditch effort they would come together with their armies on the battlefield, uh, according to what some historians would say, and they would. Proposition. Each king would proposition and say, "Why? Let's let's not fight, but let's get some. You get your biggest guy and your 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 bravest warrior, and I'll get mine, and we'll pit them against each other, and it'll be a battle of champions, if you will. And the winner will the spoils will go to the victor of that that king. And we find this is true in the scripture, and and back in Samuel chapters, First Samuel chapter seventeen, the end of. Verse 8, he said, Goliath said, Choose you a man for you. Let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. In other words, get you a man and we're going to fight and I'm the champion over here and, and there's, no need for innocent, or there's no need for useless bloodshed. Let's just get two men and we'll fight it out on behalf of our armies, on behalf of our nation, on behalf of our kings. Uh, as I begin to study, I, I can begin to think about what, what champions have we seen and, and what, what could I correlate with and what kind of things could I uh, pair with this message. And my mind went to the Olympics and uh, my mother-in-law said they were going on right now. I had no idea. I don't know if they are or not. I hadn't looked it up. But uh, simply, I just began to think about the Olympics. The Olympics is a time when nations choose their best the best they have to offer, to compete against the best that other nations have to offer. It's a time where they come together and they, they want to see if they can win the medal. They choose their champion. Tonight I have a, just a simple title, Choose Your Champion. Uh, one individual, I want to read just a few stories. I, I will not be long tonight, I do not suspect, but... I just want to take time and pick out three stories that I come across during my studies, and one of which is an individual by the name of Billy Mills, or the Billy Mills, if you know anything about Olympic history. Billy Mills was born in, on June 30th, 1938, in Pine Ridge, South Dakota. He grew up on an Indian reservation. Billy did not have an easy childhood. Everything was against him. Billy was orphaned by the age of 12. He started to run to channel his injury, uh, energy. He, he quickly was recognized because he started making records and breaking records at track at high school. And then he later learned a, or earned a scholarship from the University of Kansas. And then after graduating, he served as an officer in the United States Marine Corps. And this is where he qualified to be an Olympian. Uh, he, he, let me go ahead and preference it. It was in 1964 where he qualified to be an Olympian. He, he was more or less just someone to fill a spot. They needed someone to fill a spot. They didn't, they didn't really see much potential in him. They just said, well, he, he set some records. Let's put him in here and we'll see what happens. And uh, in 1964, the Olympics, he shocked the world from being, from being behind to winning the gold medal in a 10K race. At the time, he set a world record of 28 minutes, 24 seconds, and he is still the only American to ever win the gold medal in the 10K event to this day, as far as what I've found. His win was an upset that has been called the second greatest moment 
in Olympic history. Simply put, he was someone to fill a spot. After he had won the gold medal, a reporter came up to him and said, Who are you? Who are you? What in the world? Where'd you even come from? My mind immediately went to Philippians chapter 3, verses 14. It says, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Jesus Christ. Billy was a champion. He was not one that was necessarily the one that was chosen to be the victory or not one that was predicted to win the gold medal, but he was a champion nevertheless. Going on to another story by an individual named Kip. Um, that was his nickname during the Olympics of 1968 in Mexico City. Kip suffered from a crippling, crippling medical condition of gallstones. Kip collapsed while running a 10,000 meter, 10, meter race. Prior to running the 10,000 meter race, his doctor told him, said, do not run this race. It will jeopardize your health, and you could possibly die. Champion is someone who doesn't quit. Bear with me. I know, I know I'm, I'm, I'm off the scripture for a minute, but just I'm going to bring it back together if you would just bear with me. Kip had gallstones that he, caused him to collapse, and um, he, he ran anyways despite medical advice, and uh, you know, extreme case would cause him to death, but Kip ran anyways. Two days after the 10,000-meter race, After the race that he had collapsed in, he ran a 5,000-meter race and won the silver medal, finishing one-fifth of a second behind the gold medalist. On top of that, he ran another 1,500-meter race and qualified him for the final event. The whole time being in serious pain, serious agony, and even threat of death if he had ruptured his gallbladder. On the bus ride, the day of the finals, Kip got on the bus. They thought he wasn't going to play because he had mentioned due to his medical condition that he might not have raced. But on the day of the race, Kip slept in a little bit because he wanted to make sure he was rested up. And on the bus ride to the stadium, the bus became trapped or stuck in traffic. And Kip decided that he was going to be late and he was going to miss it if he stayed on the bus. So he got off the bus and ran the remaining two miles to the Olympic Stadium. Carrying all his equipment, he then registered with 20 minutes to spare, got himself ready, walked out onto the track, and won the gold medal. Despite already running the two miles it took to get to the stadium, he then ran a race at the stadium with a medical condition and ran and won the gold medal. He outpaced the second place runner by an astonishing 20 meters, the longest distance anyone had ever won by in the event at that time. I'm talking about a champion. A champion is someone who, despite the odds, despite being someone who may not be recognized, despite having serious injury, despite being medically told, don't do this, it's going to risk your life, but a champion is someone who doesn't listen. He, he's going to do what he's going to do because he's going to win the medal. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1, it says, Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight and sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience this race that is set before us. That's exactly what Kip did. He ran that race. He he won that race. Not only did he win, but he'd made an astonishing victory. My next Olympian that I would like to point out is one by the name of Bobby Pierce. He was born in Sydney, Australia in 1905. He was known as Henry Robert Pierce, but better known as Bobby Pierce. He dominated the world competitive and world competition of rowing through the 1920s and the 1930s. He was extremely popular with fans of the sport due to a combination of ease at which he seemed to overcome and to beat his opponents. One of his greatest examples of this was he was in a race. At the time, Pierce stopped mid-race to allow a duck and her ducklings to pass 
from in front of him and still won. He stopped his race despite being having other competitors pass him along. He stopped what he was doing to show compassion to a duck and her ducklings. He went on to win that race despite stopping and despite competing against another opponent who had several titles and several races. He went on to beat that individual with a 30-second lead after stopping in the middle of the race. The race time that Pierce had finished that race with, a 2,000-meter row, mind you, was 7 minutes and 11 seconds, setting a world record that would not beat that would not be beaten for 44 years. I'm talking about champions. Billy Mills, despite being overlooked and undervalued, won the gold. Mr. Kip, despite being having a medical condition and suffering through pain, he pushed through the pain to win an astonishing victory. Bobby Pierce showed compassion despite letting his opponents pass him by, but he still won, and he held a title that would not be broken for 44 years. These stories are amazing. These individuals accomplished something that was amazing, if you look at it by Olympic standards. But these individuals were just men. These individuals, they might be champions among men, but they were still just men. Each one was chosen to compete to be a champion. However, no matter, they were just men. You see, Goliath, he was a champion as well. But if you read the scripture, he said, don't send me a champion. He said, send me a man to fight. Send me a man to fight. It's time that we choose a champion. It's time that we stop trying to solve our own problems. And I'm, I'm getting on my own toes right here. I have a tendency to come to the altar with stress and worry and, and, and I'll pray about it. But then when it's, as soon as I get up, I'll take that problem right back on me. And, and I think to myself, you know what, I have a problem. But maybe if I work a few more hours and I put my job as my champion. And maybe if I change this around, I put something else as my champion. And Maybe we use relationships as a champion or we use substances as a champion to get away from the things that truly are coming out against us the champion of the philistines is speaking into our lives and rather than deal with it we want to deal with it in our own way rather than choosing a champion we want to sit back and try to solve the problem ourselves goliath didn't ask for a champion he asked for a man first samuel 17 and 10 We'll read it again. It says, And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. Anytime you go up against Satan in a man's way, or you try to do it in a natural, carnal way, you're going to lose. Goliath doesn't want to fight a champion. He wants to fight a man. No doubt they had heard about the victories of the Israels. No doubt they had heard about the deliverance from Egypt. No doubt that these stories had resonated with them and, and their grandfathers had passed it along through the generations and no doubt the children of Israel was notorious for having a God that would deliver them. But Goliath, he was very careful, I believe, in his word choice. He didn't say, yeah, send me, send me the God of Israel. He said, send me a man. The devil doesn't want to fight your God. The devil doesn't want to fight you on the terms of Jesus. He wants to fight you as a man. He wants to fight you as a woman. He wants to get into your head and he wants to tell you how to do it. And he wants to tempt you and show you that, oh yeah, fight me like this and fight me like that. <clears throat> First Samuel 17, 44 through 46. And it says, And the Philistine said unto David, Come to me and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air. And to the beast of the field. And then David said to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts. It makes a big difference 
how you fight your battles. It makes a big difference how you come against the champion that you face. Are you coming against the champion with a spear and with a sword? Are you coming against the champion in the name of the Lord? David said, I come against thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. Verse 46, it says, This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand. You want to know how to get victory in your life, in your situation? you got to choose your champion. Hallelujah. Second Chronicles 20 and 15, and he says, And he said, Hearken ye, all Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou King Jehoshaphat. Thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude. Don't be dismayed by the problems that you face. Don't be dismayed by the bills that come due and you don't have money to pay them. Don't be dismayed by the medical that you, problem that you got diagnosed with because man might not see a solution and you, you might not see a solution to the problem, but I've come to tell you tonight, do not be dismayed. In the end of the verse it says, for the battle is not yours but God's. I've come to tell someone tonight to choose your champion. 2 Peter 3 and 9 says, And the Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I've come to tell you that regardless if you choose Him as your champion or not, He still wants to fight for you. He's not willing to let you go just because you want to try to do it in yourself, but He's given you time and opportunity to still choose Him to fight on your behalf. He's going to give you time and opportunity. I don't know if I'm resonating with anyone tonight, but I know I felt something for somebody in this house, and I don't know what you're going through, but the Lord wants to be your champion. Hallelujah. I feel that preaching spirit coming on me, y'all. I'm telling you, somebody needs to hear what I'm saying tonight. He's not willing that any would perish, but he wants to fight for you. All we have to do is let him. When we come to the altar, let's leave it at the altar. We don't need to pick it back up. Let him fight for you. Hallelujah. Luke 19 and 9, verses 9 through 10, it says, And Jesus said unto him, This day is the day of salvation. Come to the house, for so as much as he also is the son of Abraham, for the son of man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Is there anyone in need of a champion in this house? Because he's here. He wants to fight for you, and he's searching for someone to let him. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Can I tell you tonight that he's a champion that will endow power upon you so that you can be more than overcomers. He's a, he's a champion that will look out after you and go with you to the ends of the world and will never leave you nor forsake you. The Bible says that he is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. I'm talking about a champion tonight. I'm not talking about these individuals that I read to you about. I'm not talking about Mr. Kip. I'm not talking to you about Mr. Billy. And I'm not talking to you about Bobby Pierce. They might have achieved something fantastic, but I've come to tell to you about an individual that is the ultimate champion. Isaiah 40, 28 through 29, Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, feigneth not? That is a champion by definition. Neither is weary. I'm talking about a champion of champions. There is no searching of his understanding. No, no one can compare to him. He's greater than all. He's more powerful than all. The definition I read, he fights on your behalf. That is the very definition of a champion. At the end of uh, verse 29, it says that he giveth power to the faint 
And to them that have no might, he increases strength. Let me just talk to you for a minute. I'm, I'm coming to a close. If they want to get on the music. I'm talking to you about a champion. Let me just read to you some feats about this champion. I read to you about some feats of these Olympians. These men, even though their uh, uh, ach achievement and accomplishments might have been fantastic, but let me read to you about this champion. Let me read to you about Jesus Christ, the champion of champions, the Lord of lords, the King of kings. Genesis, he created the world. Exodus, he parted the Red Sea. Matthew chapter 14, he fed 5,000 with five loaves and two fishes. Matthew 14, he walked upon the water. Mark 4, he rebuked the wind and the sea, and they both obeyed. Luke chapter 8, he says he cast out demons out of the man called Legion. This is a champion that has been undefeated, and I tell you. John chapter 5, he raised the lame man. Mark chapter 8, he opened blinded eyes. Luke Chapter 17, he heals ten leopards and makes one completely whole. If that ain't a champion, I don't know what is. Matthew chapter 21, he took stripes on his back for your healing, for my healing. Talking about a champion tonight. Matthew 27, he was crucified for your sins. This is a champion. He's fought on behalf of us tonight. He is greater than anything else. He has accomplished everything else. He, he's greater than anyone and anything. And then here he is. He's fighting on behalf of you and I tonight, Brother Rob. John chapter 19. He was buried and rose again on the third day. He had victory over death, hell, and the grave. He's a champion of champions. King of kings and the Lord of lords. But what's greater than that? Is in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, he gave power and a promise unto us. He gave power and a promise unto us. Acts chapter 2, verse 38, then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. It goes on to say, For the promise is unto you, to your children, and then to those that are afar off. I'm talking about a champion tonight. We could stand. Is there anyone in this house? I want us to think seriously. Anyone in this house have something that they need worked out? I have several things just off the top of my head. Give me five more minutes and I can write you a list. We all have things, whether it's financial whether it's spiritual, whether it's a physical healing, right now, what is on your mind? I would like to open these altars. If anyone needs something answered, the champion is in the house. He's done been victorious over death, hell, the grave. He's victorious over the demons. He cast them out by the thousand. He's done healed the sick, raised the lame, opened blinded eyes parted the seas you need something opened up for you to cross on dry land the champions in the house you need a miracle the champions in the house he's here to give you a victory he's here to get you the gold medal we're all pressing towards the mark he's here to ensure that you're able to receive and achieve your mark if we could let's just gather around Let's let the champion move in our life, work in our hearts. Let's give it to him and leave it at the altar.